So uh, today is the uh, beginning of a series of sermons for this, probably up until May. And I, I'm going to call it, um, I've called it, let's see if I can get this first slide up here. We got that first slide. It's, how many here, you all know the Lord's Prayer by, by heart, I'm, you know, most, all the adults do, I hope the kids do. Jonathan, do you know the Lord's Prayer by heart? That's good, good man. Well, you know the phrase in there that says, um, let your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Well, I've called this series the May Your Kingdom Come series because um, there's a lot of ways to describe what the Bible's trying to say in the New Testament, but the kingdom of God is a big overarching theme. And a lot of people don't understand what the kingdom of God's all about. Jesus came preaching the kingdom of God, as you'll see in a moment. So I'm, I'm calling it the Kingdom of God series, part one. Let me see if I can get this right. No, that's the pointer. All right. And the first one's called the Clash of Kingdoms. We talked about this actually a couple of days ago. Um, uh, <laughs> um, I didn't mean to quite go there that fast, but um, Clash of Kingdoms. So you know what I'm talking about, Clash of Kingdoms. God's kingdom against Satan's kingdom. He's not really a king, but we'll say he's got a kingdom. Clash of kingdoms. And I want to start off with a story that will illustrate some of what I'm trying to talk about today that began in Foley, Minnesota around 1978. Uh, I was a Presbyterian pastor in this little town in the center of Minnesota. Anybody know where St. Cloud, Minnesota is? Yeah, anybody know where Minnesota is? <laughs> well, you know, when I was in seminary in Fuller, and they said, and they, and they said, you got this inquiry from this church in Minnesota. I had to think, where's Minnesota? Because <laughs> I grew up in the East Coast. I didn't. Minnesota's out there someplace, you know. Well, anyhow, so I ended up in this little town, about 2,500 people. Interesting thing: half the town was Catholic and half was, was Protestant. So they had a Catholic barber shop and a Protestant barber shop, a Catholic pharmacy, and a. Pro I mean, all the businesses were. Yeah, grocery store, you name it, car deal, everything. It was a very Catholic area. In fact, what was the town up the road? It had a funny name, but it was a Polish Catholic town. The whole town was Catholic. And when the Pope uh, got shot, there was some, some message from, from the Vatican to that town that, you know, he's okay and all this kind of stuff when they tried to kill the Pope a while back. But it was a very Catholic area up there, along with a lot of Lutherans. So here I am, just getting to First Presbyterian Church. That's Lori and Kelly, of course. And there's the little building there. And there I am in the study, looking very, very uh, sanctified. Uh, <laughs> and uh, here I am with a mustache. <laughs> Anyone see me with a mustache? Beth made me shave it off, though. She said it tickled her when I kissed her. Uh, there's the pulpit and all. It was a nice little church. Very, uh, about 100 people. Um, man, I'll never forget those people. Amazing, amazing time. So, uh, Lori's not here today. I wanted to have her giggle over this. This is Lori Fox signing the pew card. And, uh, you know, interested in serving the Lord by Erin Gibbs. That was her best friend back then. She's about eight years old here, I think. That's where we live. And her work is school. So, um, But let me tell you what happened there. The kingdom of God broke into my life in a very unusual way. I was sitting in my study one night at the church, uh, which I don't usually do because I had an office at home. And in walks, and this is the days when you used to keep the church doors open, you know. <laughs> they were locked at night. So a lady walks in, and she's very disheveled, and uh, she's drunk, and she's uh, just very distressed. And so she said she wanted help, and I really didn't know what kind of help she wanted. Um, how many have heard this story already? Well, you have, actually, but you forgot. That's good. All right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I know you have, but you, but it's amazing. Well, you probably can't remember anything else that I've said either, so that's all right. Uh, that's all right. That's all right. Sometimes the week after I preach, I can't remember what I said. So, <laughs> But, yeah, I know, yeah. But you will remember this story. So, so I, I called Gary Gruba's sister. I forget her name, but... No, that was his wife. But anyhow, Gary Gruba's sister came over, and somehow we got this lady back to her apartment about a mile away. She'd walk there, apparently. So we put her in there, and she sits on the couch, and then she kind of lays on the couch because she's just really kind of out of it. And we're talking to her and, you know, trying to find out how can we help you and who are you and, you know, how did this all happen? And um, 
I'm and no kidding. God is my witness. All of a sudden, the room dropped 10 degrees, and I looked around and said, "Did somebody open a window?" I mean, it was just one of those weird, like never before happened kind of things. And she rolls off the couch, and then she starts wiggling across the floor, <laughs> just like in the movies. Where what do you think the movies got it? And uh, and then she stands up, and her body kind of swells up, kind of, and out of her comes this man's voice, "Get out of my house." I mean, is that creepy or what? Well, here I am. I'm an ex-Marine, you know, and I'm so I'm, I'm a, and a young pastor, and I'm thinking, oh, I have authority over that's an evil spirit. <laughs> I was really smart. I could deduce that. That's an evil spirit. So in the name of Jesus, I bind you. And then without any, without any thought, my knees started going. <laughs> I'd never talked to an evil spirit before. And so it was kind of a... You know, I was going back and forth in the name of Jesus and then and back and forth, back and forth. And finally, she picks up something sharp and, and heavy and threatens us. And I said, you know, maybe it's time to go. <laughs> uh, so we and so we're back and I say, we'll maybe come back tomorrow. And uh, we're closing the door. And uh, she says, she, uh, they say, uh, we won this time, didn't we? Can you imagine? I tell you. I went home and slept well, though. I was fine. Uh, I've always slept. <laughs> yeah, when that, I saw that sharp metal picture frame above her head, I said, you know, I don't want to get into a food fight with this lady. So we, I called her the next day, and I said, I'll call her Sally. Sally, do you, do you still want help? And she was very, very uh, sincere. Oh, yes, please come back. I said, okay, I'll, I'll bring some ladies with me. So I went and called the Women's Glow leader in town. Yeah, there you go. Women's aglow, spirit-filled, on fire, ladies, and I had about six or seven of them with me. I wasn't going in there alone. <laughs> I needed some women. <laughs> Anyhow, these ladies were prayer warriors, and we walk in there, and the air was like like buzzing. You know, zzz. I mean, you could kind of feel this tension in the air. You couldn't hear it; you could feel it. And so we sit and we talk to her, and we lead her through some prayers of confession and forgiveness. You know, just typical. Christian discipleship things, and um, and then uh, as soon as she said that she wanted the evil spirits to go and Jesus to reign in her life, poof! It was like it's like somebody opened a window and the sun came in. It just all this peace. You just felt it. It was very experiential. I mean, the whole feeling thing. And uh, this lady Sally was in our church for about a year or so. Became a youth leader in our church. Very effective youth leader. She was very gifted. Smart, energetic, um, and she, lit, she was a good person, a godly person. She started a, a clothing closet and, in town that's probably there to this day in Foley, where people would bring their stuff and it could be given away to the poor, you know, like CHKD and those kind of places. So, wonderful lady. Then all of a sudden, one day, poof, she disappears. Never saw her again. We can only uh, deduce that uh, somehow she ended up getting reinfested, re reconnected with the spirits who had been uh, tormenting her. She she told us she had been a bar fighter for most of her life. Uh, she drank a lot, went into went into bars, and got into fights. Um, and why do people do that? I mean, that sounds like a terrible thing. Anybody here been a bar fighter? Um, anybody here ever been an alcoholic? Okay, uh, lots of wonderful people have ended up in that situation, alcoholics, bar fighters, because of they're trying to kill the pain, <clears throat> pain inside of them. <clears throat> if you grew up in certain situations, <clears throat> you, you grew up with a, with a broken heart, with broken emotions, you're broken. <clears throat> you got all this pain, so what are you going to do? Well, drinking is one solution. It's not the best solution, but it is a solution. And, and because you have all this pain, you have a lot of anger. So you get into a bar, you get drunk, somebody says something stupid to you, and you start punching them out. Um, they're not bad people. They're hurting people trying to deal with the, their pain in a bad, in an inappropriate way. It really it doesn't work. It just makes more problems. Well, and the reason I th as she got reinfested, I'll, I, I believe, is because I didn't know how to disciple people after they got delivered from evil spirits. Because the evil spirits are not the problem. The problem is what's going on inside of your heart and your soul and your mind. You, you have to make room for them. You have to open a door, so to speak. You have to give them access to you through a variety of things, which I'll talk about in some future sermons <coughs> uh, this month. But uh, anyhow, I've learned more since then. So that was the beginning of getting involved in, in a very sort of personal way with deliverance ministry. 
This is a wonderful ministry. Uh, I don't know. I, that's probably that is the most dramatic example of I've seen of it in, in my whole life in 40 years of being involved in this. Most of it's just like boring. I mean, so he, it's nothing. You know, you just talk to them, pray, and the spirits go. It's nothing. They might yawn a little bit, cough a little bit, but that's it. So don't think that that is like the normal thing. That is the total uh, rarity kind of thing. <clears throat> um, but uh, and that's not all I want to. I want to. I want to talk about the dealing with the devil today. But it's not just about deliverance. I want to really talk about the kingdom of God. Because Jesus talked a lot about the kingdom of God. <clears throat> what is the kingdom of God? It's the powerful rule of God on earth, resulting in the works of Jesus to save, heal, deliver, and release abundant life to anyone who wants it. That's the, it's not defined precisely in the Bible, but this is one of the ways that it's defined by people who, like me, have been reading the Bible and studying the Bible for a long time. It means, basically it means that the kingdom of God, the kingdom comes wherever the king rules. Have you ever wondered what, what you're praying when you say, let your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven? What is that? What's that look like? How would you know if it happened? How would you know if God answered that prayer when his kingdom comes? That's a good question, right? I went all the way through seminary and never asked that question. I mean, it's amazing the things you just say over and over again. You never think what it really means. What are, what are you praying when you say, let your kingdom come? How would you know? Well, uh, I'm going to talk about that today. So, I'd like to start, this is again, uh, it's, more, it's kind of an illustration. This little beautiful setting here. Before the fall of man, I believe, it's an illustration of God's kingdom. We're in the garden, Adam and Eve, all the animals, nobody's eating anybody. They're all just having a good time. The lion's laying down with the lamb and all that. And um, in the Garden of Eden is an illustration of the kingdom of God. What was it like in the Garden of Eden? <clears throat> there was no fear. Can you imagine? You're walking with God in the cool of the day. You're hanging out with, with the creator of the universe. Are you afraid of anything? I don't think so. There's nothing attacking you. There's, there's, there's nothing to be afraid of. There's no lack. You've got everything. It's all just growing there. You don't even have to, you know, spray it for bugs or till the ground or anything. It's just fruit pops out, corn grows, whatever. Uh, there's no sadness. I mean, you're happy. You got a beautiful wife. She's running around all the time without any clothes. <laughs> I mean, what's what's wrong with that picture? There, there's no sickness. All right, there is no sick. There's no death. There's no death. He did say if you eat that tr uh, of that fruit over there, you know, you'll die. But there's no death, really, if you don't do that. There's no loneliness. The, the two of them and all the animals, they're like in perfect harmony, perfect ecology. And they got God hanging out with them every day. There's no guilt because nobody's done anything wrong. There's no shame. Who cares? We're naked. Nobody can see us. Uh, we're full of love, joy, and peace. They really are. They're, they're in such a strong, deep, personal communion with God. Um, it, they're like in heaven. It's like heaven on earth. They're children of God. That's what God called them. There's no sin, of course. It's it's like God. This is God's kingdom on earth. This is an illustration of God's kingdom on earth. Does that sound reasonable to you? Okay. Well, it's, I thought it was a reasonable. It it, it kind of gives you an idea of where we're headed. So when you know to help you understand what happens, how do you know when God's kingdom come to earth? Well, it kind of looks like this. So, uh, of course, after sin, sin fills the earth. There's guilt and shame, lots of it. A lot of lies about God, and so they end up worshiping other gods. They forget the real God, and they end up worshiping Baal or Ashtaroth or whoever else. There's eternal death for most because they're just not in touch with God. There's lots of sickness. There's a world full of temptations. There's a lot of spiritual bondage because you get involved with uh, other gods, you get in bondage. There's a lot of emotional brokenness. I'm, I'm reading this fascinating book. It's called Spirits of the Rainforest. Uh, and it's uh, the story of this primitive tribe, the Yan Yanomamo tribe in the Amazon jungle, and how they were just totally involved in the spirit world. I mean, the, the, the story is actually taught by a former sh uh, told by a former shaman named Jungle Man. And, but they, their, their world was just a world of fear and violence and murder and hatred. and uh, th They were miserable because their world was ruled by evil spirits. They were just in misery. It was like hell on earth. 
And that was part of it. They, they were just so sad all the time because everybody was being killed. Broken relationships, full of anger. I mean, this is the stuff of the, of the devil here. Fear, anger, hate, violence. Violence ruled the people. The Bible says if you don't belong, if you're not a child of God, you are a child of the devil. Kind of strong language, but uh, that's pretty much it. You belong to God or the devil because the God of this world rules this earth. There is a God. He's called the God of this world, Satan. Now, we have more power over him, or greater is he that is in us, than he, the God of the world, is in the world. But he's there, and he's ruling a lot of people who don't know Jesus. So Jesus came to save two, solve two problems. The cross of Jesus breaks the power of sin, death, and the devil. You all knew that, right? He came to pay the penalty for our sins. He destroyed the power of death to kill people forever in, in hell. And he defeated the devil to the point where he disarmed him, made a public display of him. We don't know exactly what that means, but the, the devil knows he's beaten. He's just hanging on until the, until the end. The kingdom of, and the second problem is the kingdom of God in us defeats the works of Satan now. So two problems. One is you deal with the eternal stuff, the long-term stuff, sin, death, and the devil. But then there's the stuff, how do you deal with, how do you help people deal with the problems they face on earth now? The, which is usually the works of the devil, most of it. So that's where the kingdom of God comes in. The kingdom of God is on earth in the church in certain ways. The kingdom of God, all right. Jesus, all right, announced and demonstrated the coming of the kingdom through preaching, healing, casting out demons. He preached the, the gospel of the kingdom. So the kingdom is, again, is like this big theme. God was bringing the kingdom to earth, and part of that is the gospel. The gospel is what gets people saved. That solves their sin problem. That changes them from children of the devil to children of God. That gets the Holy Spirit inside of them so that they can live a godly life like Jesus did. So he's, he preached the kingdom of God and he preached the gospel of the kingdom. Spirit-filled Christians can and should release the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven, just as Jesus did. So that's what I'm talking about today. How to do that? What does that mean? The, re, in Mark 1, right at the beginning of Mark's gospel, it says, After John the Baptist was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. So this is the good news. The kingdom of God has come. So right at the get-go in Mark's gospel, Jesus is setting the, the, uh, the, the, the uh, platform here for what his ministry is all about. I've come to proclaim to you the kingdom of God. Repent and believe the good news. That's the good news. The kingdom of God. Part of the good news, part of the kingdom is the gospel of the kingdom. You believe in me, I will get you to heaven because I'm going to pay for your sins. I'm the Lamb of God. I'll pay for your sins. You believe in me, you get to go to heaven. And then uh, just a few verses later in Mark 1, as a demonstration of this kingdom of God, there's a man in the synagogue who's possessed by an impure spirit. So demons go to church. There are people going to church today who have evil spirits. It's very common. Um, doesn't mean they're they're weird and possessed. It just means that they have an evil spirit. So he, uh, but this guy, the spirit cries out, "What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us?" Because they knew who Jesus was. I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. And Jesus says, "Be quiet. Come out of him." And the impure spirit shook the man violently, and it came out of him with a shriek. Because they don't like coming out of people. They like being people. So what, that deliverance, which is just after he proclaims the kingdom of God, is an illustration of the kingdom. Because later in Luke, he does another deliverance and he says this. But if I drive out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. So when Jesus did miracles, it was a demonstration of the kingdom of God. The fact the kingdom of God was there. That's... When we pray, Lord, let your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, we're asking God to bring something of heaven down to earth. And when heaven comes to earth, demons leave. When heaven comes to earth, people get healed. When heaven comes to earth, people get saved. When heaven comes to earth, earth marriages get healed. When heaven comes to earth, the poor are fed. 
when heaven comes to earth, um, addictions are broken in people's lives. When heaven comes to earth, depression goes and hope comes. All of that is a result of the kingdom of God coming to earth. And we as Christians get to release that. So as I said last week, Jesus was born to deal with the devil. The Son of God appeared for this purpose to destroy the works of the devil. The kingdom of God really came to take on the devil. Because he is the ruler of the world. Jesus came to, to, to bind the strong man so that we could go in and take the strong man's goods. Remember the parable about you can't walk into somebody's house, the strong man's house, unless you bind the strong man? The devil's the strong man. Jesus is bound the strong man by what he did on the cross. So we get to come in and steal back, take back from the devil, people mainly, what he has stolen from God. Destroy the works of the devil. All right. Acts 10.38, Peter's talking here. You know Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil. He connects that oppression, the sicknesses and everything, with the devil. Jesus came to deal with the devil. And Colossians 2.15, talking about Jesus, what he did on the cross, he disarmed the powers and authorities, that those are levels of demonic power, and made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. So on the cross, Jesus had a huge victory over the demonic forces. He broke their power in some way that I can't totally explain, but they, know, they can explain it. They know that they're beaten. So Jesus came to deal with the devil as part of establishing, bringing the kingdom of God to earth. So Jesus versus the devil. All right. Of course, Jesus is the foot. That's the foot of Jesus. I want you to get, get it in your mind. Some people are afraid of the devil. It, that's illegal. You're not allowed to be afraid of the devil. You're not supposed to be afraid of the devil, okay? Satan is just a, a rogue, microscopic creature compared to God. He's just a little itty-bitty thing that God made and that God controls. All right? God could vaporize the devil at any time. His day, any no, and the devil knows his days are numbered. That's why the demons will cry out, Are you going to... Throw us, are you going to throw us into the pit now? Or you've come to destroy us now? Because they know eventually God is going to do that. Um, Jesus now delegates his works of the kingdom to us. So Jesus came to deal with the devil, to confront the works of darkness, to destroy the works of darkness, and he's turned that over to us. He's passed the baton, okay, to us. We're it. <laughs> you're it. Okay, Jesus, you're all it. You've all got that commission from Jesus to continue doing what he did. He sent the 12 out and the 70 out, his disciples, to do three things. Who knows what they are when he sent them out? Preach the gospel, heal the sick, cast, raise the dead. And ca raise the dead is a, is a category of heal the sick and cast out demons. Yeah. So when the 70 came back, they said, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he, and he said, well, all right, don't get too excited about that. But get more excited about the fact that your names are written in the Book of, book of Life. But he, he acknowledged that the, the 70 and the 12, when they went out, they preached, they healed, they cast out demons, just like Jesus. So the war is over. Satan is already defeated. We get to enforce the victory of Jesus over Satan. Now in the back, in the blue, in the blue sweater, is a man who went to Europe in uh, June of June of 45, Dad, when, when did you actually put foot in, in Germany? 45, right. Yeah, June, July of 45. When did the World War II end? Was it April 45? Okay. In Europe, right. So a few months after the war, Dad puts foot into Germany. And guess what? They're still shooting at him. A few people, they call them werewolves, a few Germans who refused to give up. They'd be sniping away at the, at the American soldiers. But the war was really over. So they have to go out and hunt these guys down and shoot them because they, they wouldn't stop shooting. The war was over, but they were still being shot at. That's, very, that's a good illustration of what's happening on Earth. The war's over, but we're still being shot at by, by these guys here who hate us so much and they hate God so much that they just can't stop, you know, uh, plinking away at us. They're try I mean, there's just, 
the, the only pleasure they get is making us miserable, making, trying to make God miserable. That, that, that their pleasure is in their, is in their wickedness. And so, but they know they're beaten. Jesus beat them. But, the worst, but we, there's still this kind of residual stuff going on, on on the earth. So we get to enforce the victory of Jesus over Satan. A fourth of the miracles Jesus did involved deliverance. Do you know that? I never heard that growing up. A fourth of his miracles involved deliverance. Amazing, isn't it? Jesus in us can do that. This sermon is not just about deliverance, but I'm just but it's part of it. We can do that. And you know what? It still needs to be done. People have not changed. Demons have not changed. John Wimber on a video I was watching on the treadmill the other day said the same demon Jesus dealt with are still alive. I never really thought about that. You know, when they leave the body, they don't die. They just go to someplace else. So you could be dealing with the same demons Jesus dealt with. Only they're more afraid of you than you are of them. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So people haven't changed. Demons haven't changed. Jesus hasn't changed. So we get to do, we need to do what Jesus did, and that's to help people get set free from the influence of evil spirits. So here are the facts. All mankind deals with the forces of the devil every day. Whether you like it or not, whether you know it or not, they're, they're around you. They're studying you. They've been doing this for thousands of years, and they're very good at it. They know what you're going to do probably before you know what you're going to do. They know all your little quirks, all your little patterns. They know your weak spots. And believe me, when you get to do something big for the Lord, they'll start to push all those buttons. Oh, you like... You like a little pornography. Oh, take some of that. You like a little alcohol. Too much alcohol. You like a little uh, anger. Here, take some of that. Whatever it is, fear, they'll push those buttons because they know you. And, they, and they've got a, they have a plan for your life to take you down. Yeah. So everybody's dealing with that. Their greatest weapon is deception. Which means that you think it's your thought. You think it's just a feeling, a random feeling you have. You think it's just a random circumstance. But they're engineering things to make you think that, to make you feel that. Uh, I'm, and I can't prove that, but it seems to be the, the way that they operate is to, uh, they tempt you, uh, they afflict you, uh, they do all kinds of things to distract you. Uh, you know, a demon doesn't have to get you to do evil to do his will. He just has to get you distracted from doing God's will. You don't, you don't want to read the Bible or pray. Go watch that television show. Look, it's football season. Just, I mean, come on, give yourself a break. You don't need to pray for the next, until at least after the Super Bowl. Uh, <coughs> now in Medlin, I know. But, but it's those kind of thoughts. You don't need to, you don't need to tell your wife you're, uh, you're sorry. She knows she lo you love her. You know, just because you forgot to buy her a birthday present, she knows you love her, you know. <laughs> you don't need to return that thing you stole uh, from the office. I, well, they're, not, they're never going to miss it. they got, you know, more printers or whatever that they need, you know. It's okay. Well, those are usually thoughts from the enemy. No Christian should fear demons. I really mean that. Um, you know how they say, say dogs can smell your fear? <laughs> And it gives them, and it, it encourages them to come come at you. Well, demons know you better than dogs. Uh, you should not fear demons because you you have more power than they do. Um, if you just well, the book I was reading over uh, the spirits of the rainforest. When the evil spirits came around the Christian, they were like, Ah, get me out of here! I mean, they're terrified because of the Holy Spirit. They understand that better than we do. There's a true story about a, a little witch coven who was having, doing something in a hotel, having a little seance kind of thing. They're going to get in touch with their friendly little spirits. And this 14-year-old Christian girl walks in the room, kind of wondering, what are those ladies doing over there? And kind of walking over this way, and she's looking around. And finally, one of the older you know, witches turns around and says, Honey, you're going to have to leave. We can't do what we're here to do with you, with you here. The Holy Spirit in her was just messing things up. It was like scrambling their, their communication system. That's cool. 
So every Christian has authority to deal with the demons. That doesn't mean everybody's going to be casting out demons, although you probably could if you wanted to. But it does. But you need to know that you have authority over them, not the other way around. And the only way they have authority over you is if you give it to them. And again, we'll talk about how you give it to them, but you don't have to give them authority in your life. Oh, I messed that up really bad. Well, that, that was my last point. You have to give it to them. All right, Job. Not job, Job. <laughs> this is not an ad for, for employment. Uh, we, do you all know the story of Job, pretty much? Okay. Yeah, it's, it's one of the things we've been reading, right? Okay, so the devil... Oh, stop that. I'm giving away my thunder here. The devil has to ask God's permission to afflict Job. We all know that, right? The devil had to come and say, Oh, pretty please, can I work on this guy? Because I don't think he really loves you. And if I could work on him, I would prove that he only loves you, only follows you because you're nice to him. God said, Okay, give it a whirl. See what happens. Then God has the, de so God has the devil under his control. He is God's devil. Who made the devil? God. He used to be an angel, apparently a beautiful. We don't really know much. We have to guess a lot about, uh, you know, the devil. But apparently he was an angel, and he was faithful to God. And one day he rebelled, and he and a third of the angels were kicked out of heaven. Okay, that much, that's kind of the broad story. So, but he's God's devil. He's not like some huge God from another universe that kind of bust in and say, okay, I'm here to challenge you for the universe. No, no. You're just this little microscopic thing that I made compared to me. And uh, I'll, I'll let you do that much, but you can't go beyond those boundaries. And uh, so he, he has to ask permission to do this to Job. It's good to keep in mind. One old man's faith and patience defeated the devil himself. This is bef He didn't even have the Holy Spirit. This is the Old Testament. This is before the Old Testament, actually. This is before the Mosaic Law. He just somehow knew God, he loved God, he served God, and he hung on to his God. He said, though, yea, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. That's a good line for all of us. No matter how bad it gets, how painful it gets, how disturbing, how, how uh, confusing it gets, you need to be able to say, yea, though this situation slays me, yet I will trust in him. For I know that my Redeemer lives like he said, and, and I'll trust in him. Um, Corey Ten Boom used to say, there is no pit so deep that God's love is not deeper. I love that line too. So this one old man defeats the devil himself. It's pretty, that's a big deal. I doubt if any of us is ever going to have to go nose to nose with the devil. Demons, yes, but the devil, who's one, pers one creature, can only be in one place at one time, it's not omnip om omnipresent, He's only probably going to go after some really big, you know, he's going to be going after presidents and generals and who knows who else. But he's probably not going to be dealing with us directly. He's, he'll send his minions out to do that. But Job takes on the devil himself and beats him. And his victory glorified God in heaven and in hell. I mean, it, that was a big deal. It was a contest. Everybody knew it was a contest in heaven and hell. Okay, we're going to see what the devil can do if he can make Job hate God, turn away from God, and uh, we'll see what's going to happen here. And at the end, people in hell were, were humiliated and people in heaven were, were celebrating. And then at the end of his life, God blessed Job twice as much for that victory. He got twice as much of everything that he lost. Got all his, got ten more kids or something like that, same number of kids. But he got twice as much camels and donkeys and gold and whatever else he had that he lost beforehand. So he got this huge blessing. Now here's my point that I think the Holy Spirit showed me yesterday, which is a new thought for me, and I hope it works for you. The church is Job. Job is an illustration of the church that the devil can only get at us if God gives him permission. And he has boundaries. And as we walk faithfully with God until the end of our life, we get, we get to enter into heaven. That's like Job's getting blessed twice as much. But the point is that what Job went through is analogous, is similar, is, is like an illustration of what we're going through. Yes, the devil's attacking us. He's trying to do this and that. But... Only with God's permission and within certain boundaries. In fact, the devil had to go through to God twice. 
The first time he said, I'll just take away all his, his good stuff and he'll hate you. Well, he, so he got rid of all the camels, the donkeys and everything else. And Job was still faithful. Naked I have come from my naked, my mother's room. Naked I'll go back. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And then he comes back a second time and says, okay, that didn't work. Okay, plan, plan D. Now let me make him sick. That will get him. See, he had to come back and actually get permission for the next specific attack. So that's an illustration of the kind of boundaries that the devil has to operate in. And that's why you don't have to fear the devil. Because the God who loves you, who made you and saved you, is in charge of, of how much that devil can do. But, 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 if you give in to the devil, if you give in to his devices, he can do more. And that's what we want to avoid. And we'll talk about that more in the beginning. So what's the best defense against the devil? A what? And, right, you've heard that before. The best defense is a good offense. Right. Job's best defense was that he was a godly man. It certainly wasn't his wife's prayers. She said, oh, just curse God and die. Remember his wife? She was a real jewel. So, this is an expression of that. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. The best defense of the devil is the kingdom of God within you. The Holy Spirit is in you. The king of the universe is in you. And if you live close to him, that's your best defense. So, living in the kingdom of God... How do we do that? We stay close to God. We enjoy him more than anything. Now, what I'm about to tell you is just basic Christian discipleship instructions. You all know this, but I'm going to tell you again just to remind you. This is the best defense against the devil. Better than having holy oil or holy water and, you know, a cross, wooden cross and all that. I mean, better than all of that is to live close to God, enjoy him. Forgive quickly, confess quickly, avoid sin with all your strength. Normal stuff. Know the Bible, memorize and meditate on, on the truths. If you don't know the Bible, you're more likely to be deceived by the devil. Because he has a... If you don't know who God really is, he'll give you another definition of God. If you don't know what it means to live a godly life in, in, in detail, he'll suggest to you, well, this is really a better way to do it. So you've got to know the Bible. Joshua 1 8, you know, it says if you, if you meditate on the, the, the book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but if you meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do it, then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have success. Prosperous and success. Those are good things to have. And it's by meditating and obeying the Bible. So you've got to know the Bible. And pray without ceasing and fast as the Lord leads. Um, if you want to know how mature you're getting in the Lord as you go along, just ask yourself, am I talking, communicating with God any more this year than I did last year or five years ago? Is God more of a part of my daily life today than he was five years ago? If it hasn't changed, you're not growing very much in the Lord, I would say. You're, you're, you're maybe flatlined or maybe going backwards a little. But... In any relationship, now Beth and I have been married 46 years, we communicate better now at a deeper level than we did 20 years ago or even five years ago. Okay, Relationships um, are dynamic things. They're not static things, and they, they, whether it's spiritual or physical. And so you should be going deeper and, and more satisfying and more open and all that stuff. So prayer is like that. It's talking to God, listening to God. It's a relationship with God. Fasting helps you, as I said, tune into God. Make God the center of your daily lives. That's a big topic, but that's the truth. If if He is absent from your life most of the day, you're more likely to be deceived by the devil. Be honest with your struggles. I don't know how many people um, have gotten out of trouble spiritually just because they told somebody else and, and asked for help. If you keep it, if you have deep dark secrets about your your thought life, about your whatever, something you've done or something, that is a door that the devil is going to come through. Those little dark secrets areas. You've got to, um, you've got to bring them into the light.
uh, that's another big sermon topic, but I'll just these are summary statements. Trust God, praise God in every painful situation. Pain it can open a door to the devil if you don't handle it right. It can lead you to become an alcoholic like our friend Sally. It can lead you to witchcraft like those ladies in the room. Some of those ladies are there because they're tired of being kicked around by abusive husbands or abusive people. And so, man, we're going to get some power here. We're going to get in touch with the evil spirits, and nobody's going to do that to us again. Power-hungry people it can be a solution to pain. Instead of doing what the Bible says, give thanks in all things. Count it all joy. You know, Trust God. God's, God's going to use it for good. All right. Be humble. Ask for help. Stay in fellowship. Um, humility is a big deal with God. If you're proud, I'm not going to tell anybody my problems. Nobody, I don't need anybody in my life. I'm going to do it all myself and all that kind of stuff. You're more vulnerable. The sheep who's off here by himself, away from the herd, away from the, the you know, the uh, herd, is more vulnerable to being attacked. And then any type of addiction, confess it. It could be addiction to uh, food, uh, to um, could be addiction to television, could be addiction to video games, could be addiction to certain kinds of books. Anything that you can't give to God and say, God, if you tell me not to do that today, I won't do it. Or this week, I won't do it. If you can't say that to God about a certain thing, it's, very po it's possible you're addicted. And wherever you're addicted, that means you're not in control. And if you're not in control, then that gives the enemy access to you through that. If, if, you're, if, you're, if you're a victim of that that need to do that over and over again, then he can use that to distract you and maybe even to entice you in a wrong direction. So, here's a visual illustration. Are you ready? All right. Visual illustration of what I'm talking about. This, this would be like, uh, this portion of the service is kind of like, uh, kind of like a children's sermon. You all feel, but you you know, if you're going to get into heaven, Jesus said you have to come as a little child. So, all right, if you'll kill all the lights and put the black thing up there, yeah. Okay, it's kind of dark in here. It's not fully dark, but um, this is the the level of darkness in this room is an illustration of the life of a person who has made a commitment to Jesus but whose life is pretty nominal and pretty pretty weak, pretty weak relationship with the Lord. And so when the devil comes around to uh, entice, to afflict, to tempt, to deceive, uh, they, need, they need some, some light. They need, the, they need the light of Jesus to get out of that. So Jesus is the light of the world. So, so my first one is this little thing here. It's a, I press the button and nothing happens. And so then I have to actually start... Cranking this thing. And let's see. Oh, I get a little bit of light. So I have to go start praying very vigorously. Oh, Lord, help me, help me, help me, help me, help me. Get out of here. i got to find my way out of here, Lord. Help me, help me, help me. You know, and, and it works for a little while, but then uh, this light's going to get dimmer and dimmer cause, because um, it's not very strong and, and, and it's, uh, it's only as good as you keep cranking. So that's one person's solution to dealing with the devil. And then there's another person who, um, they go to church, you know, they're, and uh, put money in the offering and stuff like that. So when the devil comes along, they have a light. They have a way out. You know, there's a way of escape. they got a little light here. They can see their way out. But uh, they, they might bump their, their thing here, or if they drop their keys, they might not see them on the floor. Or this person here could hit them on the way out, and they wouldn't know who hit them. Uh, because their light it really isn't that bright. They're not really walking that close to the Lord. And then there's a person who, yes, okay. When the devil comes along, he's got a big light. So this person, they, they actually are they're in a small group. And <laughs> uh, they volunteer in the kitchen on Sundays. No. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're more involved. Okay, and so they're pretty good. They they can they've got enough light for themselves and a couple other people. But this area over here is still dark. Someone could come up behind them and they wouldn't see them coming. Um, they're really not aware of this area of, of this area. It's only what they're only even though they got light. It's just at the, within the circumference of that of that beam. So they're still vulnerable. They could still step in the coffee that somebody spills and that sort of thing. All right. So then 
go up if you go up one one light. So now this is better, isn't it? This is the person who's um, going to church, uh, reading the Bible, praying. You know, they're doing pretty good. And they, there's enough light for them to operate. You can see most things. I mean, they're not super clear. Uh, as you get older, your eyes don't see things in, in light like this as well as they would when you're younger. So there's some limitation, but you're basically, you can operate. Um, but uh, you can't do everything. You couldn't do fine things, you know, small things. There's some limitations on what you could do in light like this. So go all the way up. Now this is representing the life of a spirit-filled Christian who's walking closely with the Lord and trying to avoid sin and keep their heart clean on a daily basis. Um, the Bible is called the light. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. Jesus is the light of the world. Uh, the Holy Spirit came down as a tongue of fire. I mean, light is a, is a symbol of God's presence, his power, and of his kingdom. And... Um, so when we think about bringing the kingdom to earth and about confronting the devil in our daily lives, we just want to be as close to the Lord as we can be. That is the best way to deal with the devil. Um, there's, we'll talk more about how to help other people d deal with their stuff maybe. But keeping yourself safe, the best defense is a good offense. And the offense, which is very offensive to the devil, is just to be full of God, close to God, know his word, be so that... When the devil tempts you, as he tempted Jesus in Matthew and Luke 4, what did Jesus do? He quoted the scriptures three times out of Deuteronomy. Three scriptures. He just spat them back. And the devil said, just backed up each time. Said, okay, we're done. So knowing the Bible is really important. And having a close relationship with God is really important.